So welcome back. I hope that you um, you have had a uh, enjoyable lunch break and interesting discussions also outside of what's happening in this room. Um, so let us start with the third session uh, that uh, will look into challenges related to underwater cultural heritage, um, including, of course, those challenges related to climate change, but also uh, industrial development and pollution. And I'm very honored uh, to have um, with me uh, as panelists a range of um, representatives from different, uh, I wanted to say walks of life, but probably not, uh, but different um, stakeholders, uh, starting uh, with UNESCO, but also um, civil society, uh, NGOs and experts and academia. So um, without further ado, I would like to uh, invite uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Vidar Helgesen, who should be, ah yes, I see you on, on the screen, who is our um, Assistant Director General um, in charge of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. So this is one of UNESCO's um, areas of work. And uh, Mr. Helgesen is actually a quite a still relatively new colleague of ours, um, who joined us after having um, been in charge um, as executive director uh, of the Nobel Foundation in Sweden. But um, uh, Mr. Helgetsen has also initiated and led the work of the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy from 2017 to 2020 as Norway's Special Representative for the Ocean. He was also co-chair of the advisory board of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. He's an international lawyer by training and has served uh, as Norway's Minister for Climate and the Environment, Minister for European Affairs, and Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister and Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. Um, so, what, what I think would be interesting to, to hear from you um, is um, where you see the, the synergies uh, between uh, the work of um, IOC, uh, in particular uh, within the framework of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, and then also um, how, how can we um, use and what kind of tools can be used uh, through the ocean decade to protect underwater cultural heritage from um, threats such as sea level rise, marine pollution, and ocean acidification. So over to you, Vidar. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's really exciting to uh, be given the opportunity to talk about the interactions between uh, the uh, cultural heritage and uh, other ocean domains. I know you can see me, you said that, but I just want to make sure that you can hear me as well. Very well, loud and clear. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to talk in particular uh, about the work of the uh, IOC UNESCO within the context of the ocean decade. Uh, and how ocean climate change and underwater heritage can be addressed in the context of the ocean decade. Um, the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development is a, a global action framework. It has the ambition of generating the knowledge we need, uh, the science we need for the ocean we want, which is the motto of the decade. And the knowledge we need to really sustainably uh, manage the ocean so that we can ensure that it can continue to play a crucial role for humanity uh, to protect us and to nourish us. Uh, and the decade has been, uh, it's a UN decade, it's a, a general assembly mandated decade coordinated by uh, the IOC UNESCO. And it has been deliber deliberately uh, designed to consider all facets 
of ocean knowledge, including humanity's relationship with the ocean and the cultural and recreational values that the ocean harbors. Um, the decade aims through its implementation to contribute to achieving seven defined outcomes by 2030. And one of those stated outcomes is uh, an inspiring and engaging ocean where society understands and values the ocean in relation to human well-being and sustainable development. Uh, this outcome, along with the six others, uh, will be achieved by collective action of partners. One of the beauties of the ocean decade is that it's based on science, it's a science decade, but its premise is that it's supposed to ensure involvement of scientists, decision makers in the public and private sectors, philanthropies, NGOs, so that the end use of science is really taken into account in defining uh, the programs of the of the decade. So there are diverse initiatives to to meet ten defined ocean challenges, including one challenge to restore humanity's relationship uh, with the the ocean. So ten challenges and seven defined outcomes. Uh, and I think in this context that actions and partnerships to understand and apply uh, knowledge related to the cultural heritage values. Uh, of the ocean are crucial to the success of the decade. Underwater cultural heritage, built coastal heritage, intangible uh, marine heritage, and indigenous cultural heritage are all important in this context. There are already 52 global programs underway as part of the ocean decade. Uh, and one of them is the Cultural Heritage Framework Program. It's led by the Ocean Decade Heritage Network and carried out in close cooperation with the Convention on Underwater Cultural Heritage. This is really a, a lighthouse which is uh, convening and galvanizing actors around the cultural heritage values of the ocean. It was endorsed in 2021, which was the first year of the decade, one of the first decade programs, and it's made significant strides in raising the visibility of uh, issues related to cultural heritage in the ocean decade. It's coordinating various projects and activities from across the world, uh, including specific activities in Japan, Canada and Sri Lanka. But despite significant achievements of this uh, program and, and the ocean decade more broadly to create awareness, uh, generate knowledge and understanding of the importance of preserving and learning from our cultural heritage, we obviously know too well and you're discussing today how this heritage remains uh, under threat. Uh, climate change and sea level rise constitute uh, significant threats to cultural heritage, uh, both the underwater and the coastal marine heritage. Rising sea levels, uh, warmer waters creating more frequent and more severe storms and extreme weather, ocean acidification, uh, increased erosion in coastal areas can all lead to the destruction and loss of uh, uh, cultural resources located in these areas. Marine pollution is another threat. So we're standing at the uh, threshold of a, a risky future in terms of humanity's risk of losing the possibility to understand the past and uh, by that also a chance to better predict the future. There are, of course, in the ocean decade, across across the other challenges of the decade, there are numerous other programs addressing these threats, climate change, pollution, uh, and uh, related challenges. And these more sort of classically ocean science related areas, I think would benefit from closer collaboration and knowledge sharing with the cultural heritage community and vice versa. Um, there are, for example, programs generating knowledge on coastal resilience, uh, resilience to the increasing and emerging hazards coming from the ocean, uh, knowledge on coping with sea level rise, on ecosystems and biodiversity in coastal areas, and importantly, ocean literacy. And I'd like to focus my latter part of my presentation on exactly this issue, ocean literacy. 
that is uh, another of the central themes and activity areas of the Ocean Decade. Um, the framework is provided by a flagship uh, program led by the IOC called Ocean Literacy with All. And within this uh, framework, hundreds of practitioners are working with communities, with schools, with decision makers around the world to increase our understanding of the ocean, its importance, and translate science into action. The ocean literacy principle that the, the oceans and humans are inextricably connected uh, recognizes the importance of human interactions with the ocean and how these interactions have shaped the world we live in today. Generating and sharing information on uh, coastal, marine and underwater cultural heritage can really help to promote and better understand the ways in which humans have interacted with the ocean throughout history uh, and the importance of preserving these cultural resources. Just that perspective that these, this heritage demonstrates to us how our relationship with the ocean has been there for hundreds and thousands of years, coupled with the future perspective that in the next decades, a lot of that is at risk, is enough to give perspectives uh, that should really prompt an altogether stronger action to rescue uh, the ocean. So I really mean it when I say that uh, cultural heritage, traces of human activity and human relations with the ocean can really be instrumental in generating the knowledge and the action that we need to do the right thing going forward. So I think that incorporating uh, the preservation and protection of underwater cultural heritage and coastal marine heritage into ocean literacy programs uh, can help raise awareness about the importance of these resources, but also promote sustainable practices for their conservations, for conservation and for our better management of the ocean as a whole. Raising uh, awareness about the threats to this heritage uh, can also help promote preservation and protection of these cultural resources. Uh, that can involve efforts to document and uh, inventory uh, cultural resources, develop strategies for their conservation, involve communities in the importance of exactly that, um, engage them in the preservation process. And it can help uh, promote sustainable development practices that take uh, climate change, sea level rise, marine pollution into account uh, when looking at impacts on cultural heritage. It can also involve efforts to promote alternative livelihoods for coastal communities and reduce their uh, vulnerability to climate related risks. So these are areas for greater collaboration uh, between ocean literacy and cultural heritage communities in the context of the UN Ocean Decade. Uh, we believe there are examples of initiatives that uh, have the potential to generate significant benefits uh, within areas like historical uh, exploration, marine conservation, multidisciplinary learning, stories and legends. The cultural heritage coming out of this often have culture, have stories and legends that are appealing to people, art and artifacts, and uh, last but not least, traditional practices. These are dimensions that are often absent in the ocean science discourse. And uh, if we can bring them into that discourse and vice versa, I think there's a lot that uh, collectively uh, with uh, passion and ambition, uh, we can uh, achieve impact uh, going forward. And if you're thinking that, well, the ocean decade is well underway, so it's maybe it's too late. No, it isn't. We're only one third into the ocean decade. Uh, there's been a lot of success so far, but we have six and a half more years uh, to achieve impact and uh, therefore ample time for launching new initiatives and new energy into the ocean decade. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Idar, for such a uh, comprehensive uh, uh, insight into the decade action, but also shedding some light on the ocean literacy aspects. I just wanted to check with you, would you be able to stay with us uh, for the, uh, the rest of the panel? 
so that we, we can come back to you with some questions. I'm sure that there will be questions. Yes, I can. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you, and please uh, do not leave. Let me then uh, go to Stuart Leather, Associate Director, Waves Group, and um, invite you, Stuart, to speak about uh, potentially polluting wrecks which uh, definitely is uh, one of the, the threats uh, that is associated with the underwater cultural heritage. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, oh, Lori, oh, hold on tools. Right, so thank you, everyone. Uh, Edouard, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and uh, just thank you, UNESCO, for sort of presenting this, I'm obviously biased, but quite important topic to, to the forum. Um, Sorry, okay. Um, so yeah, potentially booting wrecks. I was expecting a slide. Oh, Lord, there it is. Look, I was a bit worried there. So let's sort of... So when I, when I was asked to speak, I thought, thought I had um, five minutes. I misread the communication. So then it was ten minutes. So then I've altered my slides. So, so, but let's just focus on what we're really talking about. So potentially booting wrecks sounds great. We're obviously talking about shipwrecks. But what we're really talking about is oil in the sea. Right? I could have put up a number of evocative sort of uh, pictures there of oil polluting, birds dying, mangrove shops, uh, man mangrove swamps being taken out, vital salt marsh being degraded and destroyed by oil. Okay? So what we're trying to do is, or what the focus is, is trying to prevent catastrophic oil pollution. Right? And that oil pollution, right, we've identified as a single source, is from or one source is potentially polluting wrecks. And what we're, I'm going to talk about Project Tangaroa in a minute. What we're focusing on is legacy wrecks. Legacy wrecks being First and Second World War wrecks. And sort of aged wrecks. And the reason we're focusing on those wrecks is because the ownership and responsibility of those wrecks, and in terms of the financial responsibility, isn't that clear. And it comes down to states and state parties, something that Pete Mariano and the team were talking about earlier. So therefore, there isn't sort of um, structures in place from which to deal with the pollution emanating, emanating from these wrecks, okay? So there's a nice... So, and I want to give you a sort of a slight feel of sort of what we're talking about in terms of pollution, and I'm going to use a modern case study for that. And I should have a whole series of slides to explain this, but I haven't got any, so you're going to have, I'm going to have to invoke your imaginations here. So a few years ago, there was a a ship called the Wakashio, who was on its way from Japan to, I think, South America, I might be wrong, and they were drawing near the coast of Mauritius, and understandably, it was one of the crew's birthdays, so you've got to have some sympathy, so they decided to steer the ship off the designated route to try and pick up a little bit of mobile phone signal, as you do. Right? And unfortunately, the navigation wasn't maybe as good as it could have been, and they ran the ship up onto a coral reef in Mauritius, breaching the bunker tanks and spilling a 1,000 tonnes of oil onto prime coral reef, which then floated around into mangrove swamp. Okay? So we're not interested in the Wakashio because it's a modern shipwreck. The insurers dealt with it. The cases are still going through the court. So that's not what we're concerned with. But what it does show is that that oil leak destroyed the coral reef, destroyed the mangroves, destroyed the fishing in that, in that area, destroyed the uh, tourist industry, and gave horrendous health, or gave a catalogue of health problems to the local populace in the region, okay? So you could argue, and I would argue, that it's not a good thing, okay? Let alone the, uh, bi the, the, the killing of the biodiversity and the effects on marine mammals and the marine environment, okay? So it is, I, would, I, would, I would offer to suggest it's a disaster, and that therefore we should take measures to prevent disaster. So is it a real and current threat that, the, that oil can come from legacy wrecks, okay? Is that realistic to assume? Is it happening? Has it happened? Is there some history? And why are we getting so excited about it now, okay? And why weren't we getting excited about it in the past? Well, so there are a few reasons. One is that, you know, things come in and out of fashion. Two, that, you know, as there's increased increased cases and, and examples where legacy wrecks are, in, uh, are leaking, there's more political sort of clout. 
and also technology is changing, so therefore we can do more with these PTWs. So one of the main sort of thrusts about taking the PPW issue seriously now is the idea that these wrecks, as I said, dating from the First and Second World War, are beginning to degrade, okay, quite significantly. And there's a feeling amongst experts, as soon as you say experts, you can get away with anything, okay, that actually we might be coming to a tipping point where these wrecks suddenly start spilling their cargoes. Is there any evidence for that? Well, not a huge amount, but there is some. So here's a little bit of oil, right? Terrible, I don't know why I put it in really, but that little bit of oil actually is off the uh, east coast of the UK, off of Kent, right? And here is a tug with what's called a current buster cleaning up that oil. When this oil was uh, identified, and these pictures are from the uh, UK MCA Coast Guard plane that goes out and spots the oil slicks, right? When this happened, when this oil slick was identified, this was uh, two years ago, um, all the ships in the area were sort of interrogated. Have you em emptied your bunker tanks? What have you been going on? And they were desperately trying to search, search for the source of this oil. Okay? They couldn't, it was a bit of a mystery. Eventually, by looking at the oil plots and tracking the oil spill, they actually identified that it came from, and of course you need a drum roll now, a, uh, a wreck. Okay? And the wreck that it came from Okay, sank in 19, 1947. It was a, an old Liberty ship from the Second World War. And only last year did it, start, did it decide to leak a little bit of oil. And it's a little bit. It's not, it, if it was a huge amount, we'd all know about it. It was a little bit. It had to be cleared up. It never made landfall. So, so the public never sort of uh, never put, put their arms up and sort of cry, cried sort of foul. But needless to say, the whole oil spill response cost the UK taxpayer and, more importantly, the Marine and Coast Guard Agency £7 million. Pounds. Okay? Not a small amount of money, especially if you're in a uh, Coast Guard uh, organisation and you're managing that budget because no one's really sure about where that £7 million, who's going to pay for that £7 million. Pounds. Okay? So the person that's responsible for oil spill preparedness in the UK is a little bit upset because he now has lost £7 million from his budget to deal with a, what he would call a proper disaster from a modern shipwreck, because no one is sure who is responsible for its oil. So therefore, it's a real and present danger. That was off of Kent. Meanwhile, in the UK, uh, in Plymouth, southwest uh, England, a wreck that is iconic to very old UK divers called the um, Egan Lane, that's been sunk in the Second World War and back in the day when Gary and I were young, which is a long time ago, was an epic dive site, absolutely fantastic dive site, no problems at all. In the last three years it started leaking oil as the wreck is collapsing. Okay? So that's two UK examples. We've got a little bit of oil leaking in the Baltic. We've got loads leaking in the Pacific, but let's not talk about that because we want to talk about Northern Europe. Okay? So there are wrecks leaking all over the place and there's, there's the odd event that is significant. Have we had a massive oil leak? Not yet, okay? So, let's talk about the wreck. So, I thought I'd put this wreck on the screen. This is the wreck of the, oh, no, that's not the wreck. That was when she was in her heyday. That's the Durban. So, she is a First World War wreck, and I deliberately put a First World War in wreck as uh, she's over 100 years, years old, therefore will be covered by the convention. So she sank off of Wales. Now, this wreck was, is administered or managed by the UK Ministry of Defence, um, and she was at the top of the list to be assessed for her oil volume to see if she could be potentially polluting. In other words, when she sank, did she contain her oil cargo? So we talked about the Wacasio with 1,000 tonnes of oil in, the Durban was carrying 3,000 tonnes of oil. So 3,000 tonnes of oil on the coast of Wales, going up to Liverpool and maybe even the coast of Ireland, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been a good news story and it wouldn't have been great for really any of the stakeholders within, the, within that area of the sea. Okay, so, so an assessment was carried out. I've got to be careful though, because we carried out the assessment and I don't want to sort of, you know, say how fantastic our assessment was, that would be terrible. But the point is, the point I'm making is not actually about the assessment, the point I'm making is that if you look at the red, 
Have we got a pointer on here? No. So if you look at the red image, this is from, uh, this is subsea, this is using a bit of equipment called multi-beam sonar. So the red is the Durbant in 2014, right? And the grey is the Durbant in 2019. And as you can see, the point I'm trying to make is the wreck has changed somewhat. In fact, I would call it a catastrophic collapse at the stern end. It would be better if I turned the image around, but never mind. Okay? So between 2014 and 19, this wreck has catastrophically changed and collapsed at the stern end. Right? We undertook the assessment. Good news story is we didn't find any oil in the tanks. Okay? But the point is these wrecks are beginning to collapse. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay? So oh, the other thing I wanted to say going back, I do love going backwards and forwards. Well, I won't say that. So the problem is we've got eight... <laughs> I can hear you. We've got... This, this, this chart really shows the amount of First and Second World War, or Second World War wrecks, right? This was created by a guy in Canada who works for Art, uh, Esri, and he does this in his spare time. But it gives you a pretty good idea of the distribution of wrecks around the globe for the Second World War wrecks. And we're using this figure of 8,500 wrecks globally. The figure's wrong. We know that there are most probably more, right? And of those wrecks, we haven't assessed them all, so we don't know how many are, uh, are oil tankers and what that oil volume sort of equates to. But if we were just to distill that into 400 wrecks, right, we'd still, uh, we'd still come up with a, a tremendous amount of oil, right, and a tremendous amount of money to remediate those wrecks. So if you think about remediating a wreck, that's going to cost... I'm, I'm banding around really loose figures here, you know, but it, it costs two or three million pounds to remediate a wreck. We were going to apply, uh, the UK MOD went, uh, we were going to produce a tender to look at a tanker off of Israel, uh, and the budget for that contract was five million pounds just to go and assess to see if that wreck, a, a very similar tanker to the Durban, um, had any oil on board. So, so the order of magnitude of assessing these wrecks, and if you're going to remediate and take the oil off, is quite a lot of money. So there's quite, so we've got quite a big task ahead to manage these wrecks. They're being managed by the state owners, they're being managed by coastal authorities, so work is being done. But a lot of the work that is being done is reactive as opposed to proactive. So even though wrecks are being assessed, and there are cases, there's four or five cases where legacy wrecks have had their oil removed, it's done on a sort of case-by-case -case basis, right? and normally sort of dictated by political pressure. So wrecks that have been done, there's the Minnesota by the Americans, the Coimbra, fantastic. Uh, there's work being done on a wreck in Pearl Harbor, and I'm embarrassed to say I don't know the name of it. Uh, there's the UK MOD have done the Darkdale down in St. Helena. Um, so there's quite a few. Uh, there was a Japanese, uh, a Japanese warship that was actually had an oil removal operation, which, which came from Bikini Atoll. So work is being done but it tends to be reactive on a case-by-case -case basis. So really, what, we were trying, what we're trying to do is to bring that together, right, to produce a, um, a bit more of a movement, a campaign, to, so that we can sort of start addressing the PPW problem a bit more globally, and actually through talks and through some liaisons with the Lloyd's Register, Register Foundation, uh, the Ocean Foundation, and actually some of the strategy work that we were doing within Waves, um, we've actually come up with this idea of moving towards sort of global standards for how we address poten potentially polluting wrecks. So the idea is to draft some standards, or move towards drafting standards, to get those standards ratified by the uh, IMO, so that then it's very clear about the, the workflow, if you like, or the path of action that you need to take to, um, to address your potentially polluting wreck issue. So that, that can be used by uh, coastal states that are affected by PPWs, but it can also be by, used by, leveraged by state parties or wreck owners to say to their governments, say, we need this, we need more budget to address wrecks. And hopefully going forward, and what's, what we're finding with the project is that we're producing a little bit of momentum and we're becoming a bit of a hub for what's going on with PPWs, and we're actually at the moment trying to look at financing routes and ways of financing regional campaigns and that sort of thing. So we're trying to uh, set the standards, so everyone knows what they need to do, and then looking at the ways of financing and li liaising those standards. And the uh, project really, I thought I'd better explain the name. 
So the name, Project Tangaroa, is Polynesian, and it's basically saying that, um, that if you look after the sea, it will look after you. It's the other idea of sort of ocean stewardship. I didn't come up with the name. So the main, the main thing that Tangaroa is doing is producing three workshops. So we've had the first workshop in London, which was about the regulatory framework. So we have people from uh, uh, Germany, NOAA, so US, the UK, so rec owners, rec managers uh, in Southeast Asia, right, talking about how recs are managed, right, and, and what their constraints are politically as well as financially. Workshop two is going to be in September in Helsinki, and that's much more about what are we going to do. So how do we assess recs? So how do we decide what recs we need to go and look at? How then do we go and look at a wreck and actually decide how much oil's on it or whether it's got oil? And then if it's got oil on it, how do we then go and remove that oil? So we're looking at sort of oil removal techniques as well. So that's workshop two. And then workshop three is about how on earth do we coordinate it all? What do we do with the data? And how do we make that data available so that we can learn from the projects going forward? How, am I OK for time? OK, that's it. The book, by the way. So download the book and read the book. That was actually a, 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 ma a major sort of a output from the Ocean Foundation project. OK, sorry, that's it. Thank you for, for that. That's a very um, intriguing and uh, worrisome, I would say. But uh, we, we will uh, definitely discuss uh, uh, how we can also address uh, that uh, through the Oceans Decade and, uh, and uh, the, the UNESCO Convention later. Um, I'm now happy to hand over to Marnix Peters from the Flanders Heritage Agency. Uh, who is also our STAB member, a scientific and advisory body uh, to the 2001 convention. And uh, your presentation is looking at industrial development at sea as a, as a challenge. So over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, buenas, buenas tardes. Antes de empezar, uh, me gustaría agradecer al, al gobierno español y a la ONU. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, first the Ministry of Culture and UNESCO for their invitation. Development at sea, another challenge, I'm going to move away, a little bit away from the PPW, to underwater cultural heritage. And I'm going to use the case of the Belgian part of the North Sea. You have to know that it's a rather small part of the North Sea. It's only about 70 kilometers by 100 kilometers, and it is in fact a kind of a sand desert, nothing else than sand. So, and as you all know, there are uh, industrial activities in our part of the North Sea, as everywhere in the world, I think, wind farms, dredging shipping lanes, cable laying, sand and gravel extraction, aggregates extraction, harbor infrastructure. We have one special activity, maybe, that it's not so common, that we are very keen on safe beaches. So, since several decades, we are cleaning our beaches from munitions. So, there are, there are a few companies who have a kind of a perpetuum mobile. They, mobile, they are continuously digging on our, you know, on our beaches, looking for uh, munitions, so we, we, we are very fond of safe beaches. But in the meantime, we destroy also part of the archaeological heritage. In, in the past, that was a little bit dramatic. Now we more or less are able to cope with that in another way. And luckily, we have no problems with manganese nodules, nor with gas and oil exploitation, so only a limited a limited, uh, limited set of, of challenges due to industrial development. So I'm, I'm going to give you a short flavor of the, of the underwater cultural heritage in, in the Belgian part of the North Sea. First of all, afterwards, uh, an, an overview of the, of the industrial activities and how we deal with them or not. And at third part, some, some uh, considerations, some final considerations, and finally, a little, a little bit of publicity. So. Uh, next one. So, just to give you an idea of the known underwater cultural heritage in Belgium, uh, as you see, it's a small territory, only 70 kilometers by 100, more or less, and a uh, short, short history of, our, uh, of the ratification. So, as we talked this morning about the salvage law, we had a salvage law that dated from 1547, 
made, made by Charles V, which was still in use in 2007, so we abolished it in 2007 and tried to replace it by a modern heritage law that, that did not come into effect because it, it didn't pass parliament. And then we all of a sudden, nearly out of the blue, we ratified the UNESCO convention in 2013. But and it's, it's more, that's more like a commitment of the federal government. We, we want to show that we are going to take care of, of the underwater cultural heritage. We did that before changing our, our domestic laws. So we had to do all the work afterwards. But very early on, already the next year in 2014, we had already the first implementation law that implemented, in fact, uh, the ratification of 2013. And now we are already at a second, a second version, which is still ameliorating the implementation of the UNESCO Convention. So as a result, uh, one, one of the positive effects of the ratification that we, it was very quickly we started to protect sites. Eh? Before, before the ratification, we had not a single underwater cultural heritage site in Belgian waters which was protected. Eh? From, from 20, 2040 onwards, the minister responsible for the North Sea started to protect sites and all of a sudden, in 2021, the new minister decided to protect nearly all of the, all of the shipwrecks which are more than 100 years in our, in our waters. So he, he asked to make an inventory, and that's more or less the, the distribution map of the shipwrecks which are at least 100 years in our waters. So there are about 55 shipwreck sites. And he, he decided all of a sudden the, the remaining 30 or something, at one go with one signature, he protected 30 shipwreck sites in our part of the North Sea. Nobody expected that we would have, that we would protect via this, this uh, implementation law 44 shipwreck sites. When uh, in the beginning politicians said maybe we will protect five or six or seven or even 10, at the, at the utmost maximum 10 shipwreck sites. Now we are already at 44. Nobody, nobody never uh, thought that that would be possible. So that's one aspect, that's the known heritage, and, but according to me, the, the challenge is, is mainly linked with the unknown heritage, how to deal with unknown heritage. Uh, the, the, the known heritage is rather, simp by rather simple, you know the position, you, they, are, they have been inventoried, so if you want to do something, you know there is a shipwreck, I have to take it into account, so th we, we try to avoid it. But the challenge is mainly with the unknown heritage, meaning all shipwrecks which are completely below the seabed, or uh, sunken settlements or prehistoric sites. Uh, just give you a few images. Uh, oh, I can do backwards, that's not a good way. So just to give you a few ideas, so we have, uh, e we protected even shipwrecks sites uh, from Second World War uh, in our territorial sea. We, we decided, uh, our minister decided to, that we should, we should go further than the, than the cutoff date of 100 years. So we protected the wakeful, a British destroyer where, where about 600 uh, uh, soldiers died when it was torpedoed. We have some 18th century wooden shipwrecks in the harbor and, and about 10 or uh, 10 U-boats uh, uh, in our waters. So, but if you show then to people a, a map of our, of our coastal area, of our co or marit maritime zone, People living in land, they don't, they don't really are aware. Eh? And sometimes I say, I have the intention to say that there is happening more at sea than on land. The, uh, if, you don't, if you don't know, you, don't, you cannot believe it. So you see nearly every square kilometer has a, has a, has a use. By the, blue, the blue lines are shipping lanes that, are, that is not really a problem for uh, underwater cultural heritage, except that there is some dredging some time to time, or if they decide to to deepen or to widen them, then, then there is some threat for the underwater cultural heritage. The main threat comes from the purplish areas, and I show two maps, because recently they added another big purple area, so that are the areas where, they, where we, we will have wind farms. And these are with their rather destructive, and then the other zones are the, the, the yellowish ones or the orange ones, which are the extraction zones for sand and gravel. Mostly we don't have many, much gravel, mainly sand. And the problem is there that, uh, that uh, yeah, it's difficult. They take into account the known sites, but we are not really, manage, we are not really successful in, in asking them to really explore before starting their, their destructive activities, the areas. So I'll come a little bit later back on this. Oh, no, no. That's another one. 
So when we started after, after the ratification, we immediately started to make, after some uh, examples from neighboring countries, to start to make protocols. Eh? But in fact, uh, protocols for the different sectors active at sea, uh, for people doing uh, aggregate extraction, for works uh, on the beach, uh, for works at sea. But these are in fact only reactive, reactive uh, it's too late when you find on a ship, on a, on, a, on, a, on a dredger, when you find prehistoric artifacts, it's too late, the site has already been destroyed. So that uh, you, we should be able to move, to move into a, into a proactive way of dealing with it, eh? where the developers screens the area archaeologically before starting the works. And this screening goes, pro goes, goes preferably beyond multi-beam, be of course beyond the known historic site, but beyond multi-beam and side scan, so on, and even beyond sub-bottom techniques. Eh? We, we sometimes had some examples that we ask a developer to avoid the thing, and finally there is nothing. We had some indications from the sub-bottom, and then they start to ask, why do we have to make these, these costs? So it should include at least some augerings or borings and even test excavations to really, really take, uh, to, to, to come to grips with, with the heritage present. And although Valletta, a European convention, is ratified by Belgium and implemented uh, on land, it remains a challenge to apply it to the Belgian territorial sea. And that's partly due also to our federal state structure. So the, all the activities at sea are governed by the federal government. So there is a specific law for sand extraction. There is a specific law for implanting windmills. This is all completely governed by the federal government. And they, have nobody, they are not really responsible for heritage. They mainly think about nature. So that's a, another problem, these uh, environmental impact assessments. They are very good for, the, for the, all, the, all the kind of creatures that live in the sea. Uh, every, every living creature has a chapter in the environmental uh, impact assessment, uh, the noise for the, for the sea mammals. And, but only man has a very short chapter. It's just a, a listing of the shipwrecks. And then if, uh, we did a few multi-beams there. We didn't see anything more. So that's uh, And then I think then awareness raising in circles of developers is, is I think, the most sustainable way to go ahead, they tend to think that by avoiding shipwreck sites, everything is taken into account, and that's a, a, a huge uh, mistake, of course. So the, the only example I know, it's not an example from Flanders, it's an example from, from the Netherlands, where, I, where it's, it's a very marvelous example of a very proactive way, the, the, the expansion or the, of the Yangtze Harbor in Rotterdam, where they had a lot of, a lot of study beforehand, and then afterwards, before the, the dredging started, they did the excavation and they put everything in big bags. So they, of, and that's in this way, before the dredging of the harbor started, they, they had the archeological excavations in a, in a special way, of course, with, with the GPS uh, governed uh, uh, scraper to, they, they put it per, per, per cubic meter, more or less, in, in, in big bags, and they studied the content afterwards. And so they could at least partly uh, s uh, s uh, save the, the, the underwater culture heritage present in that area. That's, that's the only very well example I, I know. But then we have, we, had some, we have some positive evolution in our part of the North Sea, so there was a, an, uh, a, a cable or a, a link, uh, electricity cable that came to our country, and then we, they screened uh, the area beforehand, and they avoided, they, they made a rerouting, a rerouting of, of the cable, so in that way, we, they avoid it, but it's also in their own, in their own, it's their own problem. If, if their machinery goes through uh, such a site, they have a lot of trouble, so they tend to, uh, to, to avoid from them with, without necessarily taking into account the heritage. It's for their own sake, a business that they uh, would like to avo want to avoid the site. So if you look a little bit to UCH versus industri industrial development. I think yeah, the known underwater cultural heritage can reasonably easily be avoided if a good inventory exists and is publicly available. But the ratification also paves the way to protect sites, eh? 40, 40 sites in, in Belgium. I nobody could, would, would, I would expect that. But I have, you have to realize that avoiding it makes you in a situation that you don't, cannot tell the, the exciting stories. If the only thing you can do for, by in situ preservation, by avoiding, this, avoiding the sites, you cannot tell the story. 
So an unknown underwater cultural heritage is the main challenge, according to me. It's the Article 5 of the Convention. Incidentally affecting is the, is the weakest article, I think, in the Convention. It's just very vaguely, the, you, the countries should b do their best to, to protect, so that's not really very strong. On land, it's, it's mainly dealt with uh, through Valletta, and that works fairly well. At sea is apparently a different story. Some countries, the EIA assessments are the way forward, but in some countries they are okay, in others I think not. And the, the huge problem is to have the, the concerns relating, related to heritage at the same level as the concerns related to the environment, to the living creatures. We should in fact have a kind of a HIA uh, next to the EIA to have, uh, to, to have it at the same level. And the full-scale proactive survey of the area that we developed should be organized, and the Yangtze Harbor is an, is an excellent example in that, in that case. And protocols are, in fact, only a last resort eh, for reporting fines. They, they, are they are rather reactive and much too late. And I think ra raising awareness is, the, is another way forward. Eh? The, the, the Yangtze project, for instance, got a lot of public attention. Everybody knows that the, Yangtze, that the harbor authorities did this, so they, this gave them a very positive public outreach. And I think... The, the, their investment is paid back by the positiveness they received afterwards. So that's, uh, and I think we have also, as archaeologists, some task. Eh? We have to improve, I think, our detection, detection techniques still more and promote our results better eh? and give more back to the developers. Eh? And if all the money leads to avoiding the sites, we will never have the stories to tell. So that's, that's a danger in decreasing public support. So that was a few ideas I would like to share with you. Ah, uh, finally, I forgot nearly my publicity. So uh, this is the ICUA 8 next year in, in October 20. And I will invite you to, to consider to, to come and to have a presentation or a session. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marnix. Uh, so um, if I understand correctly, there is a balance that is possible but we need to work towards that. Okay. So let me now then move uh, back to, uh, to our online participant. We, we should have Arturo Rey da Silva with us, who is a maritime archaeolog archaeologist and heritage re researcher who has uh, quite a lot worked with UNESCO and with UNESCO and for UNESCO, but um, who is now um, at the University of Edinburgh. And he uh, will... Speak to, about, uh, speak to us about um, um, marine cultural heritage and global challenges and how we can harness economic, social, and environmentally sustainable development. Arturo, are you with us? Do you hear us? Yes, we see yes, you uh, and hola. we hear you. Hola. Over to you, hola, buenas. Uh, okay, so, muchísimas gracias, Krista. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Krista. Thank you very much to the UNESCO for the invitation. Invitation as well. I don't know if that can be changed, or do you want me to speak in English? Because if I speak in Spanish, the invitation goes into my computer again, so I hear that back. Can you switch off your volume? Maybe. It is already uh, solved, sir. Sir, it is already solved. You can speak. Gracias. Eh, eh, perfecto. Entonces, siento... Okay. Um, I'm sorry for my interruptions because saying, as I was saying, first I would like to thank the organizers, to Krista, to Edward, to all the secretariat, to the Ministry of Culture, to Paloma, to Maria, for the organization and for the invitation. I'm going to talk to you about from, uh, from the ocean experiences from academia in terms of global challenges. And I would also refer to the indigenous communities in terms of the protection of UCH. One of the main inflection points or tipping points in the protection of uh, UCH 
has to do with the approval of the United Nations for sustainable development and also in relation to the decade for oceanographic uh, sciences for sustainable development. These two instruments have created a framework for both scientists and for policymakers that have to implement the dispositions of the, of the convention uh, so as to improve and to improve the benefits of our actions, not only in terms of uh, mitigating the, the, the challenges but also in the context of uh, rampant uh, economic uh, growth, um, also supported by the blue economy, aimed at obtaining a sustainability in resource utilization, but with at the same, which at the same time are um, developing at a faster rate than the capacity of scientists of getting to know and protecting the UCH. So it is at, it is at that specific moment in time with the decade of the United Nations when we scientists can actually direct our scientists and, and decision makers can actually direct our actions and our policies and our policies so as to protect uh, the um, UCH from the uh, present and existing uh, challenges. So first we have to define the importance of the um, in terms of uh, Mm, social, economic, and cultural um, uh, benefits of UCH. Our region is Region 1, and although it is probably one of the least developed areas in the Convention, it is the area that is making more efforts and is uh, putting uh, in place more actions and uh, providing more uh, financing for the um, for UCH. So therefore, um, section one is the most active one, not only in scientific but also in political terms. Therefore, we are setting, so to speak, the example in that regard. We can see a reflection of that in, 19, uh, in 2019 when the contribution of our works uh, have set the way for the works that we are conducting these days. Uh, we at the time decided that we needed to fully understand the characteristics of the archaeological sites and their relationship with native indigenous uh, populations. Why? Because the Convention tells us about the need to protect the natural environment of the UCH and the values of the populations associated to that. At present, we are working on the provision of results, results for uh, protecting UCH and uh, always with the aim of devising better future uh, strategies. We have also made progress in uh, different uh, projects and areas within the framework of the United Nations we have conducted research, the research that you have on the screen aimed at contributing to climate change, to eradicating climate change, poverty, livelihoods, gender equality, pollution via the interdisciplinarity and the transdisciplinarity uh, approaches that uh, would involve all the uh, stakeholders. The final aim is not only researching on UCH, but understanding UCH as the means towards problem solving rather than ultimate, the only ultimate target of research. 
involving also circular development or circular economy benefits onto economies, etc. An example of that uh, would be one of the projects from the University of Edinburgh rising from the depths financed by the UK government within the development framework. The aim was to preserve the uh, marine uh, legacy in some areas of Western Africa where the economic uh, development is uh, put in a threat to UCH and to natural resources and also to traditional uh, activities. This uh, project was uh, financed together with uh, 27 additional local progr programs participated by local actors and by including the collaboration of important uh, institutions such as the UNESCO. The aim, as I was saying, was bringing together the interest of local uh, populations with the national and international uh, legislations and the uh, protocols uh, which were of application but had not been uh, documented or drafted in a specific texts. From the beginning, we wanted to define in a joint manner a definition of what cultural marine heritage is on the basis of uh, international guidelines, but very importantly, including the contributions from the local populations. Therefore, we have seen that material legacy is very much related to uh, marine and coastal um, a heritage. There are also other areas which are an intersection which have traditionally been protected by the local communities insofar as they become, they represent their uh, the legacy and therefore the protection of their own historical legacy. As part of the results which are, are already being published and are already being translated into protocols, we can see that there is a lack of linking between the material culture and the um, areas where it takes a place and also the uh, local ecosystem. So there is a lack of, uh, of an integral uh, management. Also at the same time, Sometimes the definitions of uh, heritage do not coincide with the definitions of heritage of uh, UNESCO. So there is a discrepancy between different definitions between local indigenous communities and the UNESCO. So far, Madagascar is the only country that has uh, uh, ratified the that on the part of, uh, of uh, communities. We have also understood how important it is sometimes for local communities the regulation of their own UCH, although sometimes they uh, believe that uh, that uh, sunken vessels belong to the uh, dark side of their history. They do not consider it belongs uh, to them, therefore they do nothing. However, there are other sites which, uh, which are considered uh, divine by them and do actually protect them. Some examples. Uh, the following, the works conducted around the island of Mozambique where we were looking for the intersection of the 
sustainable coastal livelihoods, which have been uh, looted uh, before. Now, however, they are protected uh, by virtue of uh, uh, national legislation. The aim was linking nature and culture to support sustainable coastal livelihoods. So fortunately, not all UCH have been destroyed uh, so far because of uh, climate change and shipwrecks are considered biodiversity hubs and uh, as a pathways towards sustainable livelihoods. So a livelihood uh, system is being uh, created at the island of Mozambique. Another project of ours is a part of the C3 organization in the island of Mazanga in the Philippines where uh, there are approximately 14 um, wrecks uh, coming from the Second World War and around which uh, there is an enormous uh, tourist attraction and economic uh, development. These uh, benefits, economic benefits, do not reach local populations and they just endanger uh, this uh, UCH. So indigenous communities, thanks to the use of uh, their own maps and thanks to the work of the different communities have set up their own means of collaborations with the, uh, with the government so as to obtain assistance so as to protect their UCH and to protect uh, archaeological and natural sites. Mr. Helgensen from the COI has put in place another important uh, strategy. I am referring to a communication strategies so as to improve ocean literacy. I am referring to the Ocean Literacy World uh, Conference. This is one of the main um, uh, strategies of the program um, conducted at the University of uh, Edinburgh titled Sea Voice, whereby we create uh, synergies between marine cultural heritage and identity. So public and uh, decision makers do have access to uh, sea voice and sea voice results. We've seen very recently in Barcelona how the presence of marine archaeologists is being um, increased in uh, fora and gathering. There is uh, still a lot to do. Uh, there's been uh, recently a gathering in Costa Rica as attended by many um, experts, but where we saw a lack of uh, marine archaeologists. So if we move towards the end of the uh, presentation, if we have a look at traditional strategies for management for public financing, we would like to have a look at the influence that uh, research practices and pedagogical uh, practices uh, do play. This is why we aim to work with the past uh, to see what the influence of the past is on our present. We are aiming also at uh, preserving UCH and at uh, developing innovative uh, policies so as to improve the protection capabilities of the UNESCO Convention and with other programs with which uh, the different countries do have their energies, always with the aim of putting both uh, society and uh, civil society and the public at large at the center, uh, center stage. The convention is gaining importance uh, together with the knowledge of, um, of uh, 
of uh, communities, of indigenous communities in that regard. It is important to implement uh, more and more strategies, not only in Europe but in different parts of the, of the world and coastal areas. For instance, in the area of Edinburgh, we have an extensive knowledge that can uh, benefit the implementation of different strategies. Also, the need to have a challenge-led research and evidence-based uh, policy development. Also, the need uh, to highlight the heritage importance within education programs. Also, the shift towards the human and the social factor. So we can see that the 201 Convention is an essential tool to bring human behavioral change to the ocean and to its uh, sustainable uh, preservation. We still have some, a lot of time ahead to uh, implement all these actions and all these strategies for the next decades within the different uh, present and future programs. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Arturo. Um, without further ado, I would now go to our last speaker. Uh, and then we, I hope we will still have some time for questions and answers. Uh, Gary Momber is the chair of the accredited NGOs and the director of the Maritime Archaeology Trust. So, Gary, what can NGOs do all about these challenges? Well, NGOs, as I'm just about to present, can try and address all these challenges and support the work and support the challenges that are being presented today by the DG, by uh, everyone on the panel here. Um, and hopefully I can try and show you uh, with a few small slides within 10 minutes uh, how we will try and address those issues. Um, so, uh, this talk is titled A Proactive Future with Accredited NGOs, Data Gathering, Advocacy and Dissemination. Effectively, we'll, uh, as NGOs, we're coming together, we're becoming stronger and we're going to try and, uh, we're gonna try and push forward actions uh, that will try and pick up a lot of those particular issues, particularly relating to the UN Decade of Ocean Science. So, there are 19 accredited NGOs within the 2001 Convention, uh, and we also have now a bunch of people sort of applying to become observers. There's 19 NGOs, a very broad range, and I'll show you a few other, uh, I'll come back to these NGOs a little bit in a minute, so I don't need to read them all. Um, the 19 NGOs across the globe, uh, a, a whole mix with a lot of expertise and a lot of capabilities, um, and what we're aiming to do with a new project is trying to harness, uh, harness that expertise. Um, and so what we've developed is a portal, a tool, in the form of sort of an uh, interactive database where the NGOs with the experts uh, can look at the global distribution and their experts can look at the global distribution of the activities and their experts themselves within it. Um, and the database will also identify all the projects around the world and link them to SDGs. So they'll provide a list within this portal uh, of all the activities globally, how they interact, where they interact, what the lang languages, what the nations there are, and what zones within the, the UN they are acting as well. And I say we link them to the SDGs because we see there's relevance in actually linking the UNESCO, the UN, the 2001 Convention activities uh, with the SDGs across the board to make sure to demonstrate the significance of the underwater cultural heritage, as has been outlined in many talks today the relevance to understanding the oceans and society, society in itself. And the strongest SDG, of course, is SDG 14. And as we know, there happens to be a UN Decade of Ocean Science. And so, collectively, we're developing a project which has been submitted now to the, um, uh, the Cultural Heritage um, Framework Program that uh, Arturo was just talking about, through Arturo, uh, a program which will be an accred accredited program by the UN which all the UN, uh, all the accredited NGOs are signing up to, um, with the aim being to help understand the health of the ocean and the long-term patterns of change through recording, study, and monitoring the maritime underwater cultural heritage. It's called So Much Under the Waves, being Survey of Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage Under the Waves. So the goals are to gather data, um, ocean literacy and dissemination, and outreach and advocacy, which are these skills, all skills, 
that are held by the NGOs. And just by way of examples of sort of data gathering organizations, we have a range of organizations like Adramar Sindak from, the, uh, from Mexico, um, I can't read the design. Uh, uh, Degabo mentioned earlier, of course, they're involved in advocacy um, as well, and Mass in Finland. Effectively, we have a range of, uh, range of organizations that are out there working on the ground, collecting information, collecting data from sending dives in the water, collecting information, and then obviously they're disseminating them through uh, publications, booklets, and um, social media, etc. And invariably, they're working quite closely with education outreach organizations, might be with schools or, or otherwise they're giving talks. Um, we've got many organizations, and some of these have been around for quite a long time. We've got things like the um, Nautical Archaeology Society, around, been around 52 years. That's international, international programs, international programs uh, teaching, educating, disseminating. Um, we've got the Maritime Archaeology Trust, 33 years, been advocating, working in 15 countries. And place, uh, organizations like the INA, been, again, 51 years, and that works in 30 countries. And I've got in the bottom here the CIE, which is um, uh, based in the, in the Gulf, uh, working quite strongly to promote the underwater cultural heritage and you know, contributing to why there's so many uh, states in the Gulf that have signed up to the convention. So there's a wealth of knowledge, there's a wealth of dissemination, and within that there's a wealth of ocean literacy that's just been disseminated uh, incidentally outside of the UN Decade of Ocean Science. So the, the idea is to try and bring it in, bring it in together, bring it in within an umbrella as within the UN Decade project and start promoting it in, uh, and, and uh, pushing that uh, information forward. Um, and what it's done is it's linked to the seven societal outcomes, uh, seven societal, which were mentioned by the Director General earlier, and in particular to this sec session, we're thinking about climate change and also threats to the ocean. So one I've got here is a predicted ocean, which is one of the outcomes, maritime heritage, acts as datums uh, for climate and coastal change with which they can be measured. Um, and I was talking to Ahmed earlier uh, about uh, challenges to cultural heritage along the Tunisian coast. And it's, you know, I mentioned the alert program as well, the coast of France, which goes down to Spain and Portugal and the UK. Um, we, have these, we have this research into coastal heritage, uh, which helps us understand changes to the coastline through time. It's not just the coastline, it goes underwater as well. So most landscapes, we have many in the Baltic, um, we have some, well, one or two in the North Sea in the Channel, um, and they can actually tell us about past changes to uh, the sea level rise, etc., and the coastline. And here, an exposure of archaeological material for the first time in hundreds of thousands of hundreds or thousands of years can be direct evidence of coastal change. So this particular example is 3,200 years old. It's pretty much gone now. It's only, they're only around for two or three years. But you can use the archaeology to say, look, the coastline is changing. Here, here's the evidence. And people say, they'll look at maps and charts. But they only look, maps and charts only go back so far. Um, and you can use the archaeology to give much stronger indication. And so that's something that we can do. And as NGOs, a lot of them have been doing over the years. Um, and we can continue to do. And we're going to start creating sort of basic standards and recording standards to get that information to, to uh, then um, submit it to the, the, through the portals into the database so we can start collating the information. And then we're going underwater more so. We've got a clean ocean where sources of pollution are identified, recorded, and monitored. And I think Stuart made that quite clear that it's potentially a, a dramatic threat uh, to the underwater cultural heritage and, and to the environment. And we have you know, CMAS, um, all, the, all, the, all these groups that we have linked to diving organizations, uh, these NGOs, CMAS, one of our um, uh, NGOs linked to diving organizations around the world and the groups themselves. And we can galvanize those to get information, basic recording of certain sites around the globe through this network and the network that will be growing to feed back into that central database. You no, know, just simple information, which will start bringing information back about those 8,500 wrecks as, ma ma as many others. And those two um, societal uh, outcomes of the seven, uh, oops, are well, significant for discussions today. But in doing that, you also start to um, look at the other outcomes, the inaccessible ocean, because the work you're doing, be it sort of this photogrammetry, examples of which we've seen before, all this, or multi beam surveys, it actually gives people access to the ocean and makes it more accessible to the non-diver as well. 
um, issues of a safe, safe position. You start understanding about wrecks, you start understanding why they sank, where they sank, dangerous places, don't do it again. And it's wisdom from hindsight. You learn about these disasters in the past, and you bring them to people's attention as well. Healthy and resilient ocean. You understand in coastal and submerged archaeological sites within the ecosystems. You can monitor the ecosystems. You know when the wrecks went down. They hit the seabed at particular dates. So you can, uh, when you know the dates, you can look at, look at those sites and monitor them from the past, see how they're changing um, uh, through time, and record that. And of course, they're artificial reefs. They feed into tourism by the fact you've got diving and you've got fishing, you've got income streams coming from, from them as well. So the more information you can get from these sites, as we all know, uh, the more they can actually feed into all those seven societal outcomes. And what we have within the NGOs is that network that can actually facilitate that to support all the other issues that we discussed today. And ultimately, as was brought up just now by Ochuro and the Director General, is all that information can be brought to bear to tell a much more inspiring uh, story, an inspiring story about the ocean itself, inspiring and engaging ocean. And once you've got that information, you can start having an impact. You can, you, you can talk about these shipwrecks, you can talk about the, the, the desire, all the changes with them, how it's helping us understand the oceans. And that deals your heart a stronger hand when you're approaching politicians and, and basically advocating for their underwater cultural heritage. And within our group, we have a multitude of people focused primarily at JNAPC, uh, directly uh, on advocacy, ICUCH, uh, even Degba, as we mentioned earlier, we're looking at advocacy, or, or through dissemination through uh, conferences like the Society for Historical Archaeology in the States, etc. So we have all these groups in AMA in Australia, all these groups that we can use, getting the information, disseminating it, teaching people about it, and then advocating for it in the future. And then I just finished with a little slide uh, showing us where these uh, uh, accredited NGOs are active at the moment. And this is sort of Project Fillbook. And even though these NGOs tend to be sort of, uh, it's a, NGOs are more of a sort of Western world construct, but they tend to be Western world. Uh, there is activity all around the world. And the fact that we now have this, uh, that fact that we now have this observer status means that we can start reaching out to all the partner organizations that aren't necessarily NGOs that they can also contribute to this input, the data, and they can start doing something collectively that's very valuable across the globe. And I'll just I'll do that one a bit quicker. There we are. Had enough of that. Um, and so at that point, I think I'll just draw it to a close, but just to say that the NGOs hopefully can make a major contribution, and this is a process that really is just starting uh, in a way now, uh, and we're developing in a way that we haven't done before. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gary. It's comforting to know that there is an NGO community, and as Arturo said, you know, uh, the uh, academy, academia, to, to sort of look into that and and start to also, uh, you know, organize, get organized, you know, the collect data, uh, make sure that our voices are, are heard, bring it to the attention. Or the, uh, or the uh, policy makers and decision makers. So perhaps uh, before opening the floor, I, I would go back to our Assistant Director General um, and, and ask him um, perhaps a quick reaction on, on the presentations and the challenges that he, he heard about, uh, you know, be it uh, those related to industrial activities, uh, windmill parks, or uh, potentially polluting shipwrecks. Um, so how, how do you see uh, that we, we can make sure that this UCH community, uh, that our voices are heard also within the framework of the UN uh, decade uh, uh, of, of oceans? Over to you. Well, thank you. And thanks to the <coughs> fellow panelists for very uh, impressive presentations. Uh, and I think they, they really underscore uh, some of my uh, key points in that a lot of activity, uh, which is, or a, a lot of developments, both those that are hazards uh, in their own right and uh, with a negative impact on uh, underwater and marine-based cultural heritage, uh, as well as those activities, human activities that are necessary also to address 
for example, climate change, such as offshore wind energy, uh, those in effect positive actions also need to take great care not to do harm. And because of that, we need a much better knowledge-based approach to uh, ocean-based planning, uh, which is a key priority also for the ocean decade. Uh, and I'd like to add to that, that to get the awareness out there, the role of NGOs, the NGO community, as evidenced by uh, by our friend on the panel uh, and the activities he described, uh, I think is, is really essential. There is very little change possible if it's not accompanied by social movement and social mobilization. Uh, and I think that can be a great asset. And I'm very happy to hear the promising words about engagement in the decade in that context. Thank you very much. Let me then open the floor to questions, and I see some hands coming up. I've got a couple of questions and comments. Um, Would you also perhaps introduce yourself for, t for those I'm, who are uh, Timmy Gambin from, uh, from Malta. Um, so one is, I think Arturo mentioned a key factor, but it seems to have gone discreetly under the, the radar, which is underwater cultural heritage as a means for expanded research rather than focused research. I sincerely believe that the days of studying a 4th century BC shipwreck for the sake of classifying amphoras from a point 1A to a point 1B are over. One. So, well done, Arturo, but I think that that phrase should be bigger and in brighter colors. The second is a comment to, to Gary. So, given that your NGOs cover so many years and so many different seas, a small project we started in Malta is going back for legacy temperature data. You know, divers dive with computers, so they dive, they like to have their favorite dive sites. So we've started to gather temperature readings from these divers from the past two, three decades. If you could re replicate that over, you know, 50 years over the amount of countries, I think that will give you and your, your, your organization a massively important data set with regard to temperature changes, uh, etc. The third comment, unfortunately, is the, uh, it always seems to be me to introduce the elephant in the room. And that elephant today is the 50-year cutoff date. Because in the context of the uh, convention, many of the sites uh, mentioned by, by our colleagues in this, uh, in this panel are not considered to be underwater cultural heritage. So on the one hand, we can you know, speak till the cows come home about using this for leverage, etc. But on the other hand, the politicians could use that as a card against us and say, listen, you know, if UNESCO doesn't treat it as cultural heritage, why should we care? And we should care because of the things that Arturo mentioned, the potentially polluting wrecks. But I think that for those countries that do not have shipwrecks uh, covered by, by a 50-year law um, limitation, I think that this 100-year... So, so, I mean, we, are we expected to wait 20 years to start applying cultural heritage laws and approaches, etc.? Same will go for planes. They're not considered cultural heritage today, Preservation in situ is one of the guiding principles. One of the hardest assets to preserve in situ are aircraft, and in 20 years' time, there's probably going to be nothing left of them to, to, to preserve and to look at. So that's the elephant in the room. If it leads to further con uh, conversation, then, then it would uh, have served its purpose. Thank you. Any reaction from the panelists? Well. Oh, yes, I'm <laughs> micro. Um, yes, well, no, that's interesting, the elephant in the room uh, aspect. I mean, without changing the legislation, which is not my area, uh, of course, but I would say that 
there's obviously, um, by linking with the UN Decade of Creation of Science, one has a justification to explore and work with those sites uh, under that umbrella and so you get the extra benefit. And so you see it as more of a, you look at these sites as sort of, yeah, well, they're cultural assets to understand the seabed, but also in their own right. And so therefore there should be some form of, there will be some form of interest applied to them and protect them that way as well. Because I think in the comments before about the protection of underwater, the UNESCO Convention only really works when it's going to be, everyone buys into it and it's enforced anyway. Because um, quite often some think, think necessarily, uh, as was brought up this morning, um, respond to it in a way that, uh, or they're, they're different in the ways they apply it, uh, the interpretation of the law. So I think basically underneath the umbrella of the UN Decade of Science, you can address some of these. Hi, Mayor, as well. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, no, thank you as well for, for the comments. I, I also do believe uh, that uh, well, the convention itself tries to support the idea of uh, boosting uh, the protection of all that heritage and water that is also, you know, younger than 100 years as well, and pushing the countries. And maybe that's also a task that all the different associate partners of, of the convention, I mean, from the NGOs, the unit teams, and other stakeholders can boost, and maybe also competent authorities to start making a kind of tentative list of the values of underwater cultural heritage in their own countries. That's on one side, starting somehow to look into uh, what, what heritage we have that uh, is of value to, to the society in Spain without going farther. We have many shipwrecks from the Spanish Civil War that don't Can you hear me? Sorry, sorry. sorry I probably cut. So I'm saying that's one of the things that are kind of working on that side. And then looking into the value of heritage into the different challenges as, as we were talking, you know, and, and that, that we have quite a lot of importance. Uh, many of the donor countries and the foundations that we have represented in, in the room and in many of the venues in UNESCO, they have a lot of power influencing to how projects can be uh, achieving, you know, goals uh, and, and comp uh, contributing to different uh, challenges themselves uh, using UCH as the means towards that. And I think we have to start talking about the responsibility of international aid uh, in the development of these this, uh, goals, you know, and how can we achieve that and the water heritage contributes more uh, in sustainable development and all that. And I think we, we probably have to do a specific uh, not workshop, a specific talk about the importance of international aid, but also creating some kind of guidelines on how this can be achieved, looking into how we monitor and evaluate achievement and, and uh, contribution, et cetera. Thank you. About 100 years of the cutoff date, I, I think in our country, in the territorial sea, we don't have a, a cutoff date. Our politicians immediately decided we, go, we, we are going to decide what we consider uh, heritage, even if it's younger than 100 years underwater. So we have protected the Second World War ship in the territorial sea. So I, it's much easier to raise awareness, I think, for World War II than for World War I. It's m much more people are connected uh, yeah. or, or interested in World War II. So I think it's. Question yeah. Yeah. Closer to date. Yeah, closer to, yeah. Yes. Th thank you for uh, your intervention of the, the panelists. Uh, very interesting uh, um, themes and argument. Uh, yes, uh, to debate. And I'm very interested in the activity of uh, um, preventive archaeology that was presented by a colleague of the STAB. And uh, um, I. I, I, I'd like to put on the table this uh, argument. Uh, um, uh, I think that uh, it is necessary that during the public works uh, or uh, offshore works uh, in the sea or uh, along the coast and where it could be possible to find remains of wrecks, uh, and the underwater archaeologist expert in using uh, sub-bottom profiler and other um, uh, tools that are uh, used during the 
these uh, preventive activities uh, are present uh, on uh, uh, during the works in italy for example uh, our laws um, uh, authorized the presence of an archaeologist uh, during all the public works and uh, uh, thanks to the UNESCO Convention, uh, um, our ministry has uh, um, decided that uh, in underwater uh, uh, offshore works uh, have to be present underwater archaeologists, not uh, a, a a, an archaeologist in general, but an underwater archaeologist, so an expert that can see, can read the result of the uh, of th of the of this um, instrument analysis uh, instrument surveys that were done during these works and i think that uh, in this period uh, when offshore activities and works are more uh, and more present uh, I, I is important to um, to have uh, expert that know uh, the the underwater cultural heritage that can prevent the destru destruction of, of this cultural heritage. And also the problem of the uh, pollution uh, and uh, uh, it's a, a big problem and I think that thanks to technologies probably we can prevent or try to prevent the um, the deterioration of these uh, uh, wrecks uh, and try to protect uh, is a big, <laughs> a, a very important, uh, yes, it's uh, probably yes, but I don't know, uh, for example, uh, thanks to your European uh, you, uh, project, now I, s I have seen that there are a lot of projects that are uh, testing uh, and uh, that are devoted to test uh, new technologies uh, not too expensive in the, for example, I am working in one of these uh, called the Nerites, um, uh, that is devoted to um, design um, small uh, AUV, uh, um, AUV um, uh, tools that can uh, uh, do the assessment of underwater cultural heritage, a wreck of an under archaeological site. Uh, and if we can evaluate uh, the state of conservation of a lot of uh, artifacts, we can plan which is uh, in at risk uh, uh, and we can have a list of the dangerous site, dangerous site and invest in the protection of the the ones that, uh, that are at, at risk, instead to waiting that all are <laughs> in a very dangerous situation. It's we can start with one, two, three, and then uh, plan for the future the, uh, the activities. But our politicians have to know the problem, and our, uh, our um, goal is to, to inform them. Otherwise, if nobody starts, uh, <laughs> It's impossible to, to finish the work. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, I, I, I uh, also noticed that both um, uh, Stuart and, and Marnix uh, also mentioned uh, this importance of a proactive approach. Mm -hmm. That for the time being, we, we start to have data, we start to have awareness and knowledge about the sort of priorities and what, what are the issues but it's always a reactive approach. Mm -hmm. So how can we actually have this mind shift <coughs> and become proactive? It's a, perhaps a rhetoric question. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, yes, I think we, we have, a, I think, the duty to improve our inventories anyway. So we should maybe invest more money in scientific research, in screening, in screening the areas just uh, separately of, of works going to be there, just to screen your, your areas which are under danger, because what I forgot to tell, the, the, the purplish areas and the, are there is that we have, which are for windmill farms and uh, the orange for extraction, we don't know, we don't have many, much information about these zones. So if we, we should maybe try to increase our information. The more information you can give to the developers, the better. They, do, they don't like uncertainties. 
So if you compare to archaeology on land, if you have to, a project to be developed, to, to, you dig some trial trenches and you know. But we don't have that easy solution at sea. It's, there is always a, a big degree of uncertainty and that is, that's not, developers that don't like it, uncertainty. They want to know in advance what is to be expected, what I have to pay and... Uh, and Yes, they have to pay, but how much and, <laughs> and for what? <laughs> Do you, uh, I can, so, so similarly, so the whole idea of Project Tangaroa is to bring together the different inventories that exist, improve on those inventories, then come out with solutions and financing pathways, as I said, so that we can start being proactive as opposed to reactive. That's really the whole drive or, or of, the, of the Tangaroa campaign, really. Yeah. Well, I could uh, just uh, talk about, I suppose, in relation to the NGOs, um, I suppose the role is, to, the idea is to get people out to identify core standards which are there, to supply them to for the for eyes on the ground, as it were, eyes under the water. And that will provide that data set that can inform and is inherently some form of it's a proactive method of identifying where those risks might be or their existing or identify those threats in the future. Mm -hmm. So that will contribute. Um, and then once we have this vast <coughs> amount of sort of very straightforward data, we can start looking at other research questions, as Timmy mentioned, about those temperature gauges in the, um, in the sea. You, you have material that you can start actually saying, well, let's pull from that. And that's an area where further research is appropriate. So you can then sort of constantine it up and work with unit twin universities, identify areas that we can uh, develop those themes. Any act, a reaction from our online participants? Or if not, then I, uh, I, I also wanted to come back. Uh, Arturo spoke about the engagement of communities and, and indigenous people. And um, um, so how can we also uh, engage them and also perhaps within the UN decade? Uh, uh, let me go back to, to our ADG and see uh, how, how does, what are the sort of, um, outreach uh, efforts within the decade uh, to make sure that we, we have the communities, we have indigenous people, but also perhaps seats um, and those who, who are, whose voices are not always heard. Yeah, that's a, a really good and really important question. And we have, uh, we started out in the decade really having an ambition that there should be partnerships between uh, wealthier and less uh, wealthy countries and institutions uh, from these. And when we look at the decade program so far, we have seen uh, quite a lot of involvement of SIDS and LDCs, quite a lot of attention and increasing, actually quite impressively increasing attention on traditional and local and indigenous knowledge. But we're not seeing a lot of leadership roles for institutions in SIDS, for example. Uh, that led us to take action earlier this year and in one of the calls for decade actions to design that to be specifically targeted um, towards bringing SIDS institutions in leadership roles, in co-leading roles in decade programs and projects. And that call was quite uh, successful. It's still under deliberation. Uh, an assessment, but uh, but we saw that if you make an effort to uh, call for more such leadership, that potential exists. Um, obviously, such a process has to be accompanied by capacity development, uh, by guidance and tools for different stakeholders to engage and learn more from best practice on engaging indigenous and local knowledge holders and local communities. I think the regional coordination structures that we've established under the decade uh, has a very important role to play in facilitating that uptake of, of learning and experience. And obviously, last but not least, national decade committees. We have too few national decade committees, but those that we have are uh, mostly quite active and play a very important role for uh, generating and mobilizing activity um, throughout the decade. No, I mean, I'd, 
not only in as much as I would reiterate the points that uh, what well, we're spreading out, the NGOs, they can reach out into indigenous communities. And, you know, you know, there are connections in Madagascar, et cetera, that with, and with the rising from the depths like projects in the East Africa. East Africa. I think there's, there's routes there that we can reach these communities through that mechanism um, and then give them a voice through that. But there's probably other venues as well. So I think the NGOs can play their part again. So uh, just on the indigenous, so Project Tangaroa, we're very aware that we have to engage with the indigenous communities that are really similar to what Arturo has been talking about, their relationship with Rex and what they perceive as the threat of Rex and also their, their view on a remediation of a wreck in their locality. So, you know, that's very, we're, we're taking, we're making sure that we don't come from a standpoint that there's a wreck that needs remedi remediating. We're very much in terms of that uh, negotiating with local communities and communities that would be affected by a potential spill. Yeah. I see two, yeah, I mean, two hands up. Oh, yeah. Sorry, can Go I ahead, just, Arturo, just yes. sorry, I was with my hand. Uh, so no, just to, to stress uh, everything has been said in that, in that sense. I mean, just wanted to recall the, the 72 convention, the World Heritage Convention, and how there were debates in the 90s specifically to create a body for indigenous communities uh, so the voices could be heard as well. Uh, and how that was somehow not uh, approved by the state parties, because obviously, I mean, these conventions eventually, the, the, the ultimate power of the convention and the implementation uh, resides, as we all know very well, in, in the governments, in the states, and different states have different views on how to implement that in, in their own countries. What resulted of those discussions in the 90s was more the creation of a special indigenous forum, uh, indigenous communities forum, on where communities were raising their voices about the different issues concerning uh, the water heritage sites that were around the areas where they were living uh, and uh, those voices were sent especially to the World Heritage Committee to take decisions. So there are different structures that can be explored one way or the other in, 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 in the 2001 convention that could be interesting uh, to have, especially as well. Uh, inviting indigenous community to talk about indigenous communities uh, because obviously we, we see our faces and uh, none of us may be uh, from indigenous community background so we, we probably have some bias when we talk about this is something I saw as well in the UNESCO Ocean Conference in Barcelona, there was a lot of indigenous community talks uh, without much representation and the same for seats. That probably has to do with governments, uh, you know, delegating and also uh, problematics of transportation, especially from seats uh, in, the, in, in, in the Pacific. But I think, I mean, there are different initiatives in terms of policy and governance in which uh, indigenous communities and the indigenous knowledge uh, can be uh, definitely represented. And it's, it's not trying, it's giving them a voice uh, and, a, and a decision, uh, you know, possibility as well in, in the table. So that, I think that that's important to explore. Thank you, Arturo. We have two hands up. So if, if we can have microphone. Oh, you have a mm. microphone. Go ahead then. Hello, my name is Ioana and I work in, bueno, trabajo en el Instituto del Patrimonio Cultural and I was in the Institute for Cultural Heritage in Spain, and there was an aspect that was mentioned by Arturo that has taken my attention. On the one hand, on the, one hand the scientific community considers a wreck as cultural heritage, but when that is asked to the local community, the local community does not consider that as cultural heritage. We really want to engage society for them to preserve that heritage, but we actually need uh, their consideration of uh, that reg or whatever as cultural heritage. Uh, well, the process through which they are taught about what it is out there for them to do their job and then when we are involving, engaging the local community for the management of heritage, oftentimes the returns do not go back to that community because divers go there with a tour operator, they just do a round and then they spend money somewhere else. So there is a failure there. We need them to be engaged but we also need to consider or to, to find a way for those returns of benefits to come back to them. When we talk about local communities, we always refer to areas underdeveloped or, or less 
is developed, but we do not refer to it when we mention remote places, uh, remote villages in here in Spain or Italy, where local communities are not uh, giving a voice and not taking into consideration for decisions. Thank you very much for your comments. You are very much right in many aspects. Actually, well, the presentation gives a positive approach to the understanding of the heritage of low indigenous communities. Um, internationally speaking, there is a distinction between local and indigenous communities, but actually, there is the aim is to understand the link and interaction with the different communities and the understanding, the potential understanding of uh, heritage to engage in dialogue. There are, of course, some national uh, guidelines and definitions as to what it is considered heritage in different countries, which are in line or, or linked to the international agreements that countries, uh, for instance, of Group 1 approve. And in Africa, national legislation uh, have remnants from the uh, colonial power, and they have not adapted to the conventions that have been um, set up. And when we talk about development, we emphasize the economic side significantly. And that has been one of the problems for the including uh, cultural heritage within international development program. Well, to name few, 2030 only mentions agenda, mentions cultural heritage in SGA 11.4 when they talk about world heritage. And to me, the indicator to measure that cultural heritage is per income capita uh, than on cultural heritage. We only uh, consider it uh, when cultural heritage contributes to the social uh, sustainable development and social development and goes much beyond it. Econometrics. We really need to work with other indicators that also help us focus on coastal communities, communities from very many other uh, places. And uh, uh, go back to discussing international funding. Sometimes more money is coming in from the uh, Group 1 from Global North to invest in on the development of uh, Global South through uh, heritage or other initiatives. And perhaps there is needed to find regional frameworks, as Barbara mentioned, such as the European Union and the funding from it to find that. That is to say that the benefit of cultural heritage is better used in our societies in, where, in which we live. So here we are talking about different levels of complexity and, of course, of a dialogue that needs to be started with the communities about the understanding of heritage, how they assess and value the cultural heritage resources and the, uh, legis the legislations in the countries. I hope I answered your question. A wreck is colonized and encrusted by living organisms, and they create a sort of special habitat inside the wreck. When we speak about protection in situ of the underwater cultural heritage, do we intend also a protection of this special habitat? And you're asking this question to? I don't know, to whom? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I can, uh, um, well, I'll, as a maritime archaeologist, I will say that um, working 20, 30 odd years ago, I'm sure you can collude here, um, that we didn't really take much heed to the biomass, the, 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 the ecosystems associated with the wreck. And I did try on, on occasion to work with our marine conservationist friends, but they had bigger fish to fry. Um, so, but effectively, I think things have changed. And I would argue that it has to be um, incorporated into understanding shipwrecks now, preservation in situ, whatever. We should be looking at the uh, ecosystem and recording the ecosystem at the same time. And that's, that's a driver within the UN decade of ocean science as well, 
So we'll need to do that to justify, well, from our perspective, the proposals that we're putting forward. So I think that shipwrecks aren't just shipwrecks. They're living environments, and we have to respect that and see that. And that's the only way we can, by researching that, it's the only way that we can actually get a better understanding of the seafloor and changes on the mm -hmm. seafloor through time. So I'd say we have to take it on board. I'm sure that there's, sorry, sorry to interrupt, I'm sure that I bet there's an example where a shipwreck is protected because of its ecological yeah. value and not its heritage value. So I'm sure yeah. that, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, Krista? A question? Uh, I, I yes, think al also in Belgium, the first steps to protect shipwrecks were via the nature. Uh, the, yeah, you yeah. could easily, m easily move the, the minister responsible for the North Sea because others uh, could say, well, it's an interesting shipwreck, but at the same time, there is an interesting colony of such and such thing, and then mm. it, it went more, more smoothly. So, so I think we, we are allies at, at a given moment. Yeah? And so I remember that when I also had the pleasure of participating in one of the uh, um, uh, missions of, uh, of Barbara uh, and Franca, there was also a biologist uh, on, on the boat to actually work with them. So I think that it is increasingly mm. so in integrated. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question, yes. It's more an answer which is an outright no. No, that uh, natural heritage on something that is less than 100 years is, doesn't make the shipwreck protected unless it's protected from an environmental point of view. And once again, taking a feather out of Arturo's cap, it's not studying the marine life just for the sake of saying we have protected black corals, etc. But there is an intricate and inseparable relationship, especially on metal shipwrecks, between the biofilm and the protection of the shipwreck. And then if you frame that within climate change, even for deep shipwrecks, which is, you know, the depths that we manage, because if there is acidification or a change in temperature in the first two meters, A, I ask my colleagues here, have they even thought about all the Posidonia Oceanica dying and exposing all the cultural heritage that is underneath? And for people who deal with deeper wrecks, what is another lesser known fact amongst the archaeological community is that the Mediterranean's Posidonia meadows are our biggest carbon sinks. And once these Posidonia meadows start to die, and they will die within the next five years if the, he if the ocean heat waves continue, we've got to deal with the exposure of cultural heritage, but I think that's the least problem. The second biggest problem is the acidification that th these are going to, to release. So to come back to, to, to the point, understanding the natural heritage that is present on the cultural heritage is super important, not only as a means in itself to quantify and qualify the black coral and the rockfish and whatever, but also as the, the, its role in the protection or otherwise of uh, especially modern wrecks. Can I just yes, reiterate that? I think that the fact is we have to see those ships as an integral part of the ocean floor, of course, and everything around it. And that's the tool that we can use to really strengthen and use on behalf of the 2001 Convention to sort of understand, record, and manage, and, and sort of protect um, that cultural heritage in a, in a, in a race of significant, the value of it internationally. And it has been shown that um, wrecks actually do uh, encourage unique species person to that wreck. Yeah, that's, that's, there's scientific studies to show that. Yeah. Thank you so much. We have five minutes left, and what I would propose is that I go back to the panelists with one final question. You would each have one minute, one minute. and the question is, what is your recommendation to UNESCO Mm. as regards all of these dramatic challenges that we have mm -hmm. at hand. What is the top priority for UNESCO to address through the 2001 Convention, but also the, through the UN Oceans Decade? So if you can put forward one, maximum two priorities. <laughs> yeah. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> 
I was just thinking to, of saying some, something else, but maybe it can serve your question. I think that local ownership is very important. And that's maybe something we overlooked. Uh, we, we, were, we came from our scientific institutes, from, in my case from Brussels, and we looked at oh, this is a research, and we went back, and there was not really very much involvement of the local community. Now I see the last, the, over the last 20 years, the situation has changed. People, people are very, really interested. And I, we, we, have it, we had it with, uh, we, found, we regularly find cannons on the beach. In the past, nobody was interested. Nobody said, oh, your, your iron, rusty things. Now, the last, the last cannon we found was just at the limit between two, two villages at the coast, and they were disputed. It's our cannon, it's your cannon. And it was on the territory of one, of one community, and they decided to make, a, to make an, an exhibition during the summer. They were very pr and they took it as a central piece of that exhibition. So they are the local ownership, I think, for promoting uh, underwater cultural heritage. How can you best promote local ownership? By, uh, amongst others, by the... <laughs> The, the NGOs, the ON NGOs yeah. is, a, is a way, is, I think, stimulating local ownership is, is very sustainable, I think. On the, mm. Politicians listen also to the, mm. to the people. Eh? The, the more people you can convince that this is an important part of our heritage, and I understand it's difficult for the, for the high seas because it's difficult to get connected, but I think the first 10 or 15, as far as you can see, I see to connect people with, with heritage is feasible, I think. Okay. That's the only thing I can imagine for the moment. The recommendations to UNESCO, yep, yeah. just wouldn't mind. Just, okay. <laughs> so, the most important thing is awareness of the uh, potentially repeating wreck problem. So, you know, through the network that UNESCO sort of commands, the idea that through every project and through every study on a shipwreck of, of the sort of First and Second World War era, even though we've got an issue there with with, with designation or, 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 or recognition, that the idea that that cultural heritage asset could also be a pollution threat. So coming back to what Arturo was saying, put up that beautiful image of where those wrecks were in Mozambique, and if I understood correctly, they were First or Second World War wrecks. So have you considered that they might be, they might have oil on, you know? That, and if but not, that's, that's, that's a scenario. Yeah. That's a scenario. Yeah. So. Uh, we were, we were in Jakarta at the UNESCO meeting in November, and a lot of the heritage managers there that were dealing with their Second World War wrecks, absolutely fantastic, but they weren't aware that those wrecks, as well as being a fantastic heritage asset, a tourist, a tourist attraction, a fishing aggregation area, all those positive things for the blue economy could also be potentially the thing that's going to destroy all those things. So about awareness and bringing the issue of PPWs into programs. So yes, I mean, I, I go back to that point that a shipwreck isn't just a shipwreck, it's an integral part of the ocean, and I think it has to be viewed uh, as such. And UNESCO has to recognize that a nice little shipwreck isn't just a large bunch of buttocks and things, or even you know, and, and wonderful artifacts we have to study. It's more than that, it's a, it's a living site and part of the oceans that can tell us about the oceans themselves and also use it for all the, the blue economy and all these other things. It's much bigger than just the wreck itself, and that's what we should be looking and, and promoting. Thank you. Arturo, over to you. Yes, very good point. So, well, well said. Uh, yeah, the, the ocean and the heritage as a living one was, was in my agenda, but I'm going to be more practical. I'm going to give maybe recommendations to rather UNESCO in general, the Secretariat itself, uh, to push countries towards some of the actions I'm going to mention. One is already underway, the creation of a, a, a result-based uh, framework to specifically uh, identifying indicators that can tell us uh, well, how the, the convention is being achieved, the principles of the convention, but as well, you know, looking into the contribution of underwater cultural heritage in the framework of the convention towards some of the key challenges that we have. So that creation of 
hopefully, you know, aiming at getting a reporting mechanism for the convention that doesn't exist today. And that's something that we have to probably uh, uh, take with countries because it's the, the, their responsibility and um, boost that they push for this in the meeting of state parties because only through a reporting mechanism we can contribute to the robber report on cultural policies that Mondia Cult is, is charging UNESCO to do because it's through that that uh, and the water good heritage will get a place uh, in, in that global report. That being said, it would be interesting as well and maybe it's a plan as well to have a regional strategy for Group 1 develop after this meeting that can contribute to uh, the implementation of the Convention and developing strategies and maybe doing uh, later on when we have all the indicators and the reporting mechanism, a uh, global report on uh, the situation of underwater cultural heritage uh, worldwide. I think that would be very useful if we incorporate several voices including indigenous and local communities as well, NGOs, universities, etc. How to do it is a different thing. I'll leave you for you, UNESCO, <laughs> because I know it's a, it's a very difficult task, but I've seen this can uh, tell us, you know, with uh, different uh, measurements and different uh, metrics, uh, some of the indications towards we, where we are going. That's one point, and the other one would be more on what I said, and uh, it seems that Tim uh, like as well, understanding marine heritage and the water heritage in, in the wider sense as the means to, to, to achieve uh, some of the most pressing societal challenges that we have, and uh, maybe some of the strategies of the Convention, so, uh, uh, even some of the points on the operational guidelines can be also looking to helping countries implementing uh, policies towards that uh, point. That's all from my side. Thank you. Excellent. Let, let us then give a round of applause to our panel. And I think we, are, we now deserve um, something else. <laughs> Paloma, what do we deserve? Yes, an announcement, brief. Brief announcement. Archaeology. Tenemos que estar en la puerta del museo a las seis. We need to make it at the door of the museum at 15 past six. Six fifteen. At the entrance of the museum, followed by concert and dinner. Good morning. 9.30. 9.30. So uh, for those of you who will get lost or who, who prefer not to come to museum, then uh, we, we will see back here at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you, panelists, uh, and, um, and see you in a bit. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you.